Ed, welcome to today's webinar, Gas versus Diesel for Standby. What's best for your customers? I'm your moderator, Jeff Muniz from Caterpillar Electric Power. Today we are joined by two featured presenters and experts from Caterpillar Electric Power, Steve Turner and Bailey Quintrell. We'll begin with Steve, who will be sharing information about electric power diesel offerings. Steve is a market consultant supporting customers in the healthcare sector with their emergency power needs. Steve holds a bachelor's degree in business administration and economics from Monmouth College in Monmouth, Illinois. In his 10 years with Caterpillar, Steve has held several territory sales positions across the U.S., supporting Caterpillar's electric power diesel offerings. We are also pleased to welcome Bailey Quintrell, who will be going over electric power gas solutions. Bailey holds a mechanical engineering degree from Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta, Georgia. Bailey began his career in power generation at German gas generator company MWM, which was, hired, which was acquired by Caterpillar in 2012. Bailey is currently a territory sales manager for gas generators, serving customers in the western U.S. and Canada. He previously held the same role in the southeast U.S. Before we get started with Bailey and Steve's presentations today, we want to know a little bit about you, our audience who has joined us. We'd appreciate your participation in our first poll question, as we'll have a few of these throughout today's webinar. And our first, qu first poll question is, what is your job role? Consultant, contractor, end user, student or educator, or another occupation? As you're answering this question, I want to quickly go through some of the details behind today's session. Caterpillar Electric Power is looking to provide informative webinars on relevant electric power topics while also offering continuing education units, CEUs, or PDHs, Professional Development Hours. Since 2016, Caterpillar Electric Power has been offering webinars like this on a quarterly basis. For today's meeting, we have muted all phone lines. We do still encourage questions, and those can be submitted by clicking on the Q&A box to the left of the slides. The meeting is being recorded and will be posted to the landing page. Feel free to review it at your convenience. We will address as many questions as time permits at the end of the presentation. If we do not get to your question, we will come back to you personally as soon as possible. In addition, we plan to post general questions and responses to the landing page. If you are a U.S.-based engineer and have requested CEUs or PDHs, we are required to ensure you stay with us for the duration of the webinar. The CEUs themselves will be issued by Bradley University and are intended to help those individuals with a professional engineer license meet their annual learning requirements. You will need to check with your state licensing board to ensure the CEUs are applicable. Now let's take a look at our results from our first poll question. And it looks like we have a large contingent of consultants on the call today, set just over 72%. We have some contractors, end users, just a couple students and educators, and 16% of you have identified yourself as another occupation. No matter what your occupation is, we are certainly happy to have you here with us today. And without further ado, I want to introduce to you our featured presenters for today from Caterpillar, Steve, Turler, Steve Turner and Bailey Quintrell. Steve and Bailey? Thanks, Jeff. This is Bailey. Um, first, I'll uh, cover the topics that we're going to discuss today. So the first will define what a standby application means to Caterpillar uh, when you're applying the generator set. We'll also look at NFPA 110 which is a North America-specific standard that's uh, an important part of standby power system specification uh, for most of North America. And then we'll get into some more comparison between diesel and gas generator sets, uh, particularly what their capabilities are uh, and emissions and, and where those differ between diesel and gas. So first, you might be wondering why a company like Caterpillar would offer a line of natural gas standby generators and a line of diesel standby generators. Uh, this is twice as much work for us to develop um, and engineer these uh, two lines of generator sets, but we feel like uh, different customer requirements make one or the other a clear choice for most applications. I'll give a, a gas example and then Steve will give a, a, a diesel example of, of where a customer considered both and, and why you might end up with one or the other. Um, on the gas side, we had a, a project in northern Alabama for a, a regional uh, water authority. This is for a new freshwater facility, and they needed two megawatts of standby power. The way the site was laid out, uh, they were concerned about 
diesel storage and the fact that a, a leak had a high probability of impacting the quality of their water supply. So because this customer was uh, concerned about um, fuel and, and the ability to leak and affect the water supply, for them, natural gas uh, was the clear choice. Steve, you want to give us a diesel example? Sure. Thanks, Bailey. I'll transition to another project we had here in the Midwest region. Uh, this time it was at a wastewater treatment facility. The site had previously been using diesel for their backup. They were looking to expand, adding more capability to their facility. Uh, but they were looking into looking not just at diesel, but also natural gas for this facility. So the process um, of evaluating the gas first diesel was a fairly open throughout the entire project. The customer uh, was, was open to both options. They ended up using our sizing software, Specsizer, and they evaluated the loads both on the gas and the, the diesel generator sets. So as with most wastewater treatment facilities, it had some large motors, um, which resulted in some large starting KVA um, to be put on these generator sets. So at the end of the sizing, the site evaluation, the diesel still made sense for this customer. The capability of the diesel generator to pick up these, these large motors certainly made a difference for them to choose the diesel at the end. So um, they were comfortable with going the diesel route after evaluating both diesel and natural gas for this site. All right. Thanks, Steve. Um, before we dive deeper, Jeff, maybe it's a good time for another poll question. You bet, uh, Bailey and Steve. Thanks for those examples. And this is a great opportunity to engage our audience and, and to kind of hear from them and, and where they stand when they're talking with their customers or, or what they're doing out in the world uh, around gas and diesel generator sets. So we'd, we'd appreciate your participation in this poll question. So which of the following have you specified in the last two years? Choice A, diesel gen sets. B, natural gas standby gen sets. C, both. Or D, none. And so as you're answering that question, Bailey, I'm going to pose a question to you. Are we seeing a trend either way uh, with either of these fuel types uh, uh, over the last few years? That's a good question, Jeff. Uh, I would say for standby uh, applications, I think diesel still has a, a larger share, but we're seeing a trend to have more and more uh, interest in natural gas generators for standby applications. This started on the small end uh, of the product line, you know, down in the um, few hundred kW, sub 400 kW range, and it seems to be moving up through the rest of the, uh, the, the size range for standby generators. So it's, uh, it seems to be increasing, and I think that's kind of the general trend, more interest, and we're actually seeing more projects uh, go gas. All right, thanks for that input and insight there, Bailey. And let's take a look at what our audience is saying they have specified over the last two years with our first poll results here. So 36% of them say they uh, have uh, specified a diesel standby generator set, 8% just a natural gas standby generator set. Now, almost half of our audience, this is our largest number there, have said both, and just a few have said none. So as you can see, I think the audience is going to be very interested in the material that we're going to cover here as we'll cover both diesel and natural gas gen set and standby applications. So with that, I turn it back over to you, Bailey. All right. So as we dive into this, first let's uh, define what standby, what a standby application means uh, at Caterpillar. So for Caterpillar, it means that the, the generator is not the normal power source. Uh, it also means that we don't expect it to run more than 500 hours in a year. And I think uh, for most standby applications, 500 hours would be unusual. But certainly if there are extenuating circumstances, the generator sets designed to be capable of running longer than that, uh, you know, if there's an outage requiring it. Um, we also expect for a standby application that when the loads are on the, the generator, that the loads are varying and averaging about uh, 70%. So when, especially in North America, when we talk about standby power applications, NFPA 110 uh, is usually a, a part of the conversation. So let's uh, briefly talk about NFPA 110 and, and why it's important uh, in our application of gas or diesel generator sets. So starting at the top of the, uh, the slide, um, you see NFPA 110 Level 1 Type 10. These are for emergency systems uh, that are required for safety of, of human occupants of the building. Uh, this is often referred to as 10-second start, but we'll see in a minute there's a little bit more to it uh, than just that. In the middle, we have 
legally required standby or NFPA 110 level 1 type 60. And these are uh, loads that are important um, for rescue workers or um, things that must happen in a building such as, uh, as, as sewage pumps or, or ventilation. Um, these loads are allowed to be without power for up to 60 seconds uh, after the utility power goes away. And then at the bottom, we have optional systems. Uh, these are systems that are providing power to protect uh, business interests and not uh, human life safety. So that would be generators that are supporting, uh, you know, data equipment or IT equipment or, you know, refrigeration or, or freezers. So like we talked about, NFPA 110 Type 10 is probably the most commonly specified uh, NFPA uh, emergency system requirement. And it's, like I said, it's often referred to as 10-second start. Uh, but that can be a little bit of a, of a misnomer. Um, so to, to clarify that, we'll walk through the timeline here of what happens um, in an emergency standby power system when the utility power goes away. So if you'll walk with me through this, starting at the left side of the timeline, at, at uh, the beginning, there's the utility outage. Uh, and it takes up to one and a half seconds for uh, the transfer switch to decide that, yes, the utility power is not present and it's not coming back quickly, uh, and then at which point the ATS um, signals the generator set to start. It will then attain rated speed and voltage in about six and a half seconds. Uh, and then we have up to two seconds for the transfer switch to qualify the generator set as a valid source of power and then transfer the load onto the generator set. So we may call it 10-second start, but what it really means is that the generator's got to start in, uh, in six and a half seconds for the entire power transfer to happen. Something that's also uh, commonly interpreted for NFPA 110 is you might see an AHJ with a stopwatch at a job site um, waiting for the light. You know, they'll kill the power from the utility and then wait for the lights to come on. That usually works okay, but um, the, the letter of NFPA 110 just requires the power to be available on the load terminals of the transfer switch uh, within 10 seconds. So depending on the type of lighting at the site and the power distribution, the lights may add some other delay that's not a part of NFPA 110. One other thing on this timeline that I wanted to point out because it will be important later on, if you see on the, on the yellow area of the timeline we have two load steps. There could be uh, any number of, of load steps. Uh, and this is something that is particularly important for gas standby generator sets. To, uh, it, it's helpful if we can segregate the life safety loads from other loads, uh, assuming that there's a significant portion of other loads on the generator set, which is pretty typically the case. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. So when we talk about gas and diesel uh, generator sets or the engine part of the generator set, there are a lot of similarities. Uh, you know, the core engine iron, like the block, uh, the crankshaft, uh, connecting rods are all very similar. Pistons are maybe a little bit different in design, but they're uh, uh, of similar construction. Uh, but there are some significant differences, primarily in the, um, the air fuel system uh, and um, in the ignition system. Right? A, a gas engine has a spark ignition system, a, a diesel engine, which is also called compression ignition, uh, it does not have an ignition system, but rather has fuel injectors that inject directly into the cylinder. And these uh, fuel differences have the biggest impact on uh, why emissions are so different between diesel and gas and why uh, diesel and gas engines accept uh, load different or perform differently with um, transients. So let's take a closer look at why um, the transient performance of diesel and gas engines are different. This is a flow chart that shows uh, what happens in a diesel engine when it's running at a, at a given load and then that load changes. Let's, let's, for sake of this, we'll talk about a load increase. So if you look in the middle of the diagram, you can see the piston, the engine, uh, and a box that says, you know, the, the engine, um, uh, when the load is applied, the engine loses speed. That's how the engine knows that it needs more power. Uh, and so it responds by injecting more fuel directly into the cylinder, which uh, produces more heat in the exhaust, which drives the turbocharger faster and pushes more air into the cylinder to burn more fuel on the next revolution. Uh, so this is a, a really quick feedback loop. The engine is able to respond 
very, very quickly just by immediately injecting uh, more fuel into the cylinder. So if you contrast this with a gas engine, um, we'll walk through this and, and you'll see the differences. So the, the starting point's the same, the engine's running, uh, an additional load is placed on the engine so the engine slows down. Uh, it calls for more, uh, for more power and the response of a gas engine is to open the throttle valve, which you see to the left of the, of the piston and cylinder, which lets more air-fuel mixture into the cylinder, producing more heat to drive the turbocharger faster, which then drives more air into the air intake system, which where it can then draw more fuel and then make it into the cylinder. So rather than being able to inject fuel directly into the cylinder to respond to produce more power, the gas engine it can only make an incremental improvement um, in terms of the amount of fuel going into the cylinder until that heat reaches the turbocharger and can drive um, drive the turbocharger faster to push more air and fuel in. So it's just it's a longer feedback loop and it makes the engine take longer to respond to to changes in load, particularly big changes in load. So if we look at the actual performance difference between a gas and a diesel standby generator set, these are uh, these two plots you see on the screen are out of the Caterpillar Specsizer program. Uh, they're both for a one megawatt generator set, and they're both for a 100% block load. The top is for a natural gas generator set, and the bottom is for a diesel. So with a one, one megawatt, 100% block load, uh, the gas standby generator set and the diesel have basically the same dip, so about 19% frequency dip. Uh, the voltage dip is also really similar, 40% for the gas standby and 38% for the diesel standby. Uh, the major difference is the recovery time. For the gas, it's almost 50% longer uh, than it is for the diesel. So like we just talked about a minute ago, um, this longer feedback loop for the engine to uh, add load is the reason why uh, the recovery time is longer. But um, I think for a lot of applications, the initial dip is really more important than the recovery time. You know, as long as the dip is within the requirements of the uh, equipment that makes up the load, then it's okay if it takes a few seconds longer to recover. At least there are probably situations that differ, but I think for a lot of situations, uh, that's true. One other point that's uh, important to note is that um, whether the engine is hot or cold uh, makes a difference, uh, but it makes a bigger difference for gas uh, than it does for diesel. And this is because like we talked about with the gas flow chart, uh, the, the gas engine is more dependent on the turbocharger than the diesel engine is because the diesel can direct, uh, inject fuel directly into the cylinder. So if, if we take a, an example of this is a, a one megawatt uh, standby gas generator set from Caterpillar. In the, there, in the performance data sheet, um, there is a page that includes load acceptance data. So I just wanted to briefly talk about this to um, – uh, make everyone familiar with it. So if you're looking at a project uh, down the road, you can quickly see how to compare the performance of gas and diesel and see if the gas might work well for your situation. So we'll take a closer look at the two components of this transient information sheet. Uh, the first part is this um, chart that was at the top or plot. Uh, and if you look across the bottom, the, um, the x-axis is the initial or the running load of the engine. Uh, and the y-axis is the size of the load step. So if you plot those two points, um, it, 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 you're either in the blue, the yellow, or the gray, and the difference is and the blue represents a G2 class um, performance of the engine. This G2 class is a part of ISO 8528. In the yellow, um, that means it's a G1 class um, response, and then the gray means it's, it's not doesn't meet either G1 or G2, uh, but the engine will... Um, recover from that size load step is just going to have a frequency dip that's outside the range of uh, the classes um, defined by ISO 8528. So to take an example, if you had a 20% um, load step, I'm sorry, if the engine was running at 20% and then you took a 60% load step, if you came across the x-axis to 20 and then go up the y-axis to 60, you'll see you're um, in the yellow range. So that means that the engine was running with 20%. You added 60, so now it's at 80% load, uh, and that would give a G1 class uh, response, which is um, G1 class would be acceptable for a lot of uh, a lot of applications in terms of voltage and frequency dip. 
One other important point to clarify, uh, we talked about hot versus cold engines. Um, a jacket water heater does not make an engine hot. Hot means that the engine has uh, previously run with load uh, so that all of the exhaust equipment uh, is hot, exhaust uh, manifolds, turbochargers, et cetera. This is a, um, the, the quick reference table that's on the same, on the same sheet. And uh, this is important if you're you know, kind of doing a, a, a rough uh, design for a project and you're trying to decide is you know, one size generator or another going to work for the size loads you have, this shows for a given load step what the frequency deviation, uh, voltage deviation, and recovery time will be. So you can kind of quickly size a project roughly. Uh, and the reason why hot versus cold is, is important, if you look in the recovery time column, which is the third column from the right, uh, you'll see that for the first three load steps, so for the largest load steps, 175 and 50% load, there's two recovery times. The longer recovery time um, is for an initial cold load step. So that would be an engine that has just started, uh, has not run with load. The initial load step will have a longer recovery time uh, than a hot engine. And since we're talking about standby, most of the time, the initial load step for a standby engine uh, is on a cold engine. So this is really the recovery time that's important. Uh, we wanted to be make sure that our, our engineers and customers understand that, um, that there is a difference between hot and cold, particularly for gas. Uh, but I think for a lot of standby applications, um, recovery time doesn't make, um, is, is not a major factor. As long as the load uh, can be accepted and the engine's available within 10 seconds, then the recovery time, we probably have a little bit more flexibility with that. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to, to Steve Turner. Thanks, Bailey. Appreciate that. After going into some transients, we're going to transition now into more of the emissions and then also get into some of the differences in the fuel between natural gas and diesel. So on the mission side, both natural gas and diesel generator sets are subject to EPA regulations here in North America for stationary, uh, stationary engines. So on the diesel side, when you're speaking compression ignition, we, we have two different types. We have the, the stationary emergency, and then we also have the, the stationary non-emergency product, again, both on the diesel product. When you speak specifically <clears throat> excuse me, to the gas product, the spark ignition product, you speak um, under the EPA regulations for the Quad J regulation. So um, similar regulations, but different for both the diesel and the natural gas product. So that's the regulation, and then there's also different emission requirements for the application. So at the federal level in North America, you have both the emergency and your non-emergency product. On the emergency side, this is for when there's a, a loss of utility, as Bailey talked about earlier. Um, you can do some testing, some maintenance, then also some storm avoidance under this emergency application. When you go to your non-emergency product, that's when you are using the, the engine uh, when you still do have a utility. So when you're using the engine in a continuous or prime application, uh, you use, can be using it for peak shaving at a facility, base loading, and then also demand response. So again, you have your different classifications for diesel and gas, and then also you're different based off of your application on how you're actually using that generator set. So in the chart below, you do see the, there are different emissions regulations for each of these classifications. So on the diesel side and natural gas side, there's different regulations for your NOx, your CO, uh, your PM levels. Um, and specifically, when you go from your emergency to non-emergency, you do have different, emergency, different levels of uh, requirements at the federal, um, federal level. So when you go from the emergency to non-emergency, you go into a more stricter requirement for emissions regulation. So as you see on the diesel side, your PM goes from 0 0.1, 0 0.2, excuse me, to 0 0.03, for example. And then on the natural gas side for your COs, you go down from four allowed at um, emergency side. You go to your non-emergency, you go, it's more stricter to your two. So. Again, this is just at the federal level. Um, you have federal regulations. They set the minimum requirement. So specific states, counties, cities certainly can have more strict requirements. And we'll get into that a little bit further. But I think, Jeff, this might be a good time to do our next poll question. 
Yeah, Steve, you just walked through some, some good information there around emissions regulations. But, so, but we want to talk to you, the audience, and hear from you uh, in, in specific about how much do you expect emissions regulations will impact whether you or your customers purchase gas or diesel generators in the future? Choice A, a significant impact. B, moderate impact. C, little impact. D, no impact. So if you uh, don't mind uh, answering that quick poll question here, at the same time, I'm going to ask... Uh, Steve, a quick question just of how do emission regulations impact maybe the project work that's going on within Caterpillar? Sure. It's, it's a good question. It's certainly something that's always on our mind here at Caterpillar. We need to stay out in front of this to make sure we have a product ready for the marketplace that is suitable and meets EPA requirements um, as a manufacturer required to do that. So we're always looking out, out in front to see if there's emissions regulation changes. I believe that the biggest thing that has uh, made the the largest impact recently is going to the Tier 4 in your non-emergency applications. Um, that has, has driven a lot of manufacturers to create that Tier 4 final product. The other thing that Bailey talked about earlier is that uh, we are certainly seeing a trend towards the natural gas due to the changes and you know the additional cost and extra work that needs to be done to get to Tier 4 final. We are seeing certainly more of the natural gas applications coming because of those regulation changes. All right, thanks, uh, Steve, for providing that insight here on kind of the work that goes in at Caterpillar specifically regarding emission regulations and, and keeping up with those. But let's see what the impact is from our audience on what they're saying to our customers. So a significant impact, 23%. The, a moderate impact, just over uh, 42% there. A little impact, 27%. And about 7% of you saying there's really no impact uh, there, but it, overall, there you're, you're seeing about 66 percentish uh, saying there will be an impact here, uh, based off of emission regulations. So let's look at the impact of regulations, maybe in a specific location now, Steve. Sure, I think that's a good transition um, to, spe to talk specifically about one state. As I said earlier, EPA sets the regulations um, for the minimum level of, of emissions for our product, but you know. Any state, city, or county can have even more strict regulations. So speaking on more strict regulations, usually one of the first places that comes up is, is California. They certainly have some areas of, of more strict regulations. As you can see on the, the chart here, um, there's, there's some several air boards in California, and each of these air boards could have different emissions regulations differing from EPA. Generally, the more majority of them do line up well with the EPA regulations, but there are certain ones, um, specifically the San Francisco Bay Area, maybe South Coast Air Quality Management District, that also do have some stricter regulations in those areas. So working in this area that the people in California certainly understand, but if you are working on projects into that area and you're unfamiliar, we certainly recommend working with somebody locally that has the understanding or the CAT dealer network there that has the understanding of what's, what regulations and emission requirements are allowed for that area. So speaking a little bit more, we've, we've talked mostly about standby. I want to take a, a, just a quick moment here to talk about the, the non-emergency product. So for sites that are wanting to do the demand response, the peak shaving or base loading for their emergency generator sets, the units must meet these non-emission regulations. And as I spoke to earlier, these are the more strict requirements for your NOx, your CO, and your PMs for both your diesel and your, your gas generator sets. So what type of uh, requirements are needed to be done to both the diesel and gas generators? So first starting off, the, the diesel non-emergency emissions must be met with Tier 4 final. So all product coming and shipping out should be Tier 4 final. It must be certified from the factory, so that comes from the factory as a certified Tier 4 final product, which as, as you can see in the top right picture there, it's, it's a complex after-treatment system. So most of the uh, In-cylinder work has been completed to get as much exhaust or, or much uh, reduction in emissions as possible. Now a lot of the work needs to be done um, on just the exhaust coming out of the machine. So as you can see there, it's a very complex system that reduces the emission levels. Some additional equipment is also needed. So in addition to just a, um, the gen set, you are needing some possibly a, a depth tank, your air pressure system, and also a dosing cabinet to assist with reducing those emission levels coming out of the, the diesel generator. 
On the flip side, when you talk gas and you, you're, you're speaking non-emergency emission requirements, it can simply be met with just an oxidation catalyst. The oxidation catalyst is, is sized to the site, uh, but it is a simple flow-through catalyst that is fairly easy to manage compared to the, um, the after-treatment system on a diesel unit. But overall, the gas emissions um, are lower so when they start, so it's easier to manage and easier to reduce to the required levels of non-emergency. So now let's speak uh, specifically on the fuel and the fuel system differences. So diesel, as, as we know, it can be stored on site at, at the generator site location. So this does allow for that complete site independence. So they aren't relying on another utility to be available for that for the fuels to for the gen set to run. On the flip side, there is is cost to that. So they have to prepay for that fuel that's sitting there. And then there also is a cost to, to storing it. So there has to be a tank, there needs to be space for it, it needs to be constructed to be able to to uh, store that, that fuel that's available. And then also on top of that, you, it does require maintenance. The fuel cannot be just left un, untouched. Um, there is roughly a one-year shelf life for this the diesel fuel that sits in there. So treatment needs to be done to keep it stable. Some of the larger facilities might have some type of um, cleaning system. Some of them might have set up contracts to have people come in and do that for the site. But it's certainly something that needs to be thought of um, before that gen set runs up after the fuel has been sitting there for a while. On the flip side, natural gas cannot be practically stored on site in most applications. So you are dependent on the utility, that other gas utility, um, but it is also considered a safe source in many jurisdictions. So no on-site fuel storage costs, so you aren't having to prepay for that fuel that's sitting there like you do on the diesel side. But at the same time, you aren't having to um, have storage costs. It's, it's just readily available when it's needed for the application. All right, Steve, I think this is a good time. Maybe do a quick knowledge check, uh, make sure our audience is sticking with us. And I know they are because they are submitting a lot of questions through the Q&A function as uh, Steve and Bailey are going through their uh, presentation here. So we will have some time here at the end to get to that. But quick true-false question. Natural gas can be practically stored on site. Let's see what our audience members had to say. True or false to that question. If we can check out the poll results here. 95% say false, which is in alignment with what Steve just talked about. Now, there was about 5% that say true. There are some possible applications where natural or gas can be stored on site. Is that right? Sure. It's not something that we typically see fairly often, but some of the, the much smaller product does have the option to store some on, on site. But the typical standby application, uh, typical industrial commercial applications, um, storing the natural gas on site does not make a lot of sense. You usually typically go into the diesel application when, when you are needing something on site. But to take this one step further, it, it is a fairly common question that we get, and I'm sure there's probably a few in the Q&A right now, but how, how reliable is the natural gas pipeline? And something that we, we typically uh, like to reference fairly often, this is a public document, but the Department of Defense did a report uh, a few years ago on studying the, the, the reliability of the natural gas pipeline during uh, emergencies, during earthquakes, during, during the time when you need it most. And what they did was a study um, to go out there and see whether for their backup power they should be using natural gas or diesel at these sites. So it's, it's a report that we, we go to often but it's a report that um, we, we really value their opinion on the, the work they put into this. So at the end of the report, it's, it's basically summarized that we, we not only trust the pipeline, it's, it's, it's a very valid, it's, we do everything possible to not shut off that natural gas pipeline. It's going to be the last option, even in um, the, the disaster zones uh, if, if things come up. But we, we actually recommend our Department of Defense to, to specify and use natural gas for facilities moving forward for their backup power. So it's a, it's a good report. Um, it, it answers a lot of the questions that typically people have on whether they should specify natural gas or diesel generator sets. So if you do have the same question, this would be a good report for people to go out there and view. 
Another thing on comparing a little bit of the natural gas and the diesel generator sets that comes up is, is footprint. So footprint um, is, is you know the size of, of this generator set and what what size footprint does it fit into in your facility. So in, in general, the, the natural gas generator set um, is the power density of these units is much less than the diesel. So what does that mean? That you know, for specifically, here's a good example. If you see the two pictures off to the right, full 3512 Caterpillar generator sets. 3512 means that they're 12 cylinder engines. One's a gas engine on the top, the diesel's on the bottom. Uh, both similar size engines, but the gas generator gets about 1,000 kW out of it. The same footprint, same similar size diesel size um, product on the bottom gets about 1,750 kW out of it. So we can certainly get more power out of the same size footprint on the diesel side. So if space is a consideration, have a tight tight footprint that you need to fit a product into, certainly diesel is is, is the one that makes better options um, for those types of applications. So as Bailey talked before, you know, we certainly wanted to have options available for our customers, both gas and diesel, because they certainly make make a Certain applications require both. So here's here's a quick picture. Um, we just wanted to show you know from 50 50 kW all the way up to 2 meg on the gas standby side. We have product available. These pictures aren't aren't to scale, but just wanted to show the differences. You know we have the small product, we have the large product. We can parallel products to make even even more uh, above the 2,000 kW. But certainly on the natural gas product, we have product from the, the smallest to the largest that are available for customers to choose from. And on the flip side, on the diesel side, um, the same picture. We have you know product all the way down to 40 kW uh, with our C4.4 engine all the way up to our C17520, which is a 20-cylinder, 4-megawatt product on the diesel side. So again, echoing what Bailey said earlier, this is... Um, we, we have the offerings from the smallest to the largest, uh, both on the natural gas and diesel side. So we want to be able to offer your customers, your clients, um, the options that they need when selecting a product for their site. So getting to the summary, you know, uh, we talked earlier, um, both natural gas and diesel generator sets can be used in these sta standby applications. As Bailey mentioned, uh, they are NFPA 110 capable. Uh, they are 100% block load capable as well. And as I mentioned, they can be sized in our CAT Specsizer software. You can go to specsizer.cat.com. If you aren't a, uh, don't have an account yet, you can log in for free, and you can do your own sizings on both gas and diesel generator sets there. And then getting into the summary of the differences between the diesel and the gas generator set, as I said, diesel has that um, the lower dollar per kW which uh, results in that smaller footprint, uh, the better transient capability of picking up that starting motor. And it also does have that fuel on site, so you can be fully independent of the utility, but you do have that fuel storage cost and the, the maintenance of keeping that, that diesel fuel available. If you need to go to a non-emergency application like demand response, peak shaving, or base losing, it does add a lot of complication and cost on the diesel side. When you go to the natural gas side, it does have the lower emissions. So going to the demand response, peak shaving, and base loading, there is significantly less cost and complication. But it certainly does make more sense to go with the gas on that side in most applications. And it also does not have that on-site fuel. So on, on the negative side, it's not truly independent, but uh, you don't also have the fuel storage and maintenance costs as you do on the diesel side. And I think with that, I'll turn it back over to Jeff. All right. Thank you, Steve Turner and Bailey Quintrell, for providing us a detailed look into gas versus diesel for standby, what's best for your customers. Just judging by the number of questions that we're getting in our Q&A function, lots of good information presented there. I think some clarity and some additional questions here that, that will help uh, help our audience members hopefully better understand what, what option is best for their comp uh, customer. We'll, we'll come here over the next 20 minutes, so we have a, a good amount of time for questions and answers. Before we get to the questions, there will be additional resources, including a recording of today's webinar, available for you on the landing page, and uh, that will be available to you as soon as possible following uh, today's webinar. So 
Let's take a few minutes and address as many questions as we can. Bailey, we'll start off with you. I think this is a question that, uh, that, that maybe you can touch on a little bit more. What op opportunities are there for dual fuels? So we had Steve talk a lot about diesel. You were talking quite a, bot, a bit about natural gas. Maybe talk about both of those together. Is there opportunities there? <clears throat> yeah, Jeff, that's a, a question we get pretty often. Uh, dual fuel or, or sometimes referred to as biofuel uh, is when you add or fumigate natural gas in the intake system of a diesel uh, generator, and it, it basically just displaces some of the diesel burn. Um, this is oh, – Caterpillar actually offers um, – by fuel generators and kits to make existing generators by fuel, uh, meaning diesel and natural gas, but um, those are, are generally applied outside the U.S. Uh, the challenge we have in the U.S. is that the, the EPA uh, hasn't recognized um, by fuel in their uh, standards yet, so that's, that's generally a, an outside the U.S. Uh, solution. What, probably one point to clarify, too, uh, before I forget, Jeff, is that um, with a, a biofuel system, uh, some diesel fuel is always required. So the, the natural gas uh, can extend the runtime of the diesel storage, uh, but it cannot completely replace diesel. So you're still, you may extend the runtime of the diesel tank, but you're still limited um, to the capacity of the tank because up to usually a minimum of 30% diesel will be needed. And if the load is changing, it will be a higher percentage diesel. All right, thanks, Bailey, for that uh, much more detailed information regarding the possible use of diesel as well as natural gas together. So, Steve, we're going to maybe stick with that topic as this is what we're covering today. What is maybe the difference in maintenance on diesel and gas gen sets? Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, and there's a lot of similarities, mostly than, um, more than differences, I'd say. Uh, when, you, when you're speaking the, the standby product, um, you're, you're typically uh, going to have very similar preventive maintenance agreements on, on the gas standby as you would a diesel standby. Um, certainly there's some different components that you need to uh, switch out more um, depending on the product. But typically in the standby application, you're going to have similar application uh, for, for maintenance. Uh, when you get to the diesel side, um, certainly as, as I mentioned before, there is the additional maintenance of that fuel, which can be a significant cost if, if you're storing a lot of fuel on site. Um, that could add a lot of cost to either a standby or um, a non-standby application for diesel fuel. So certainly something to keep in mind if you are going to be uh, maintaining a lot of fuel on site, um, that you will have to have that ongoing cost of making sure that fuel is, is polished and continued to maintain. Uh, when you get to the, the non-emergency, the, the non-standby product, um, it's, it's certainly uh, gas is fairly similar. Again, you're going to have to probably do some more preventative maintenance just based off the runtime and the hours used. Uh, but when you get to the diesel side and you have tier four, there's certainly more components to the, the system that needs to be maintained from the, um, the DEF system, your air compressor, if you have an air compressor on the system. Um, just overall, there's just a lot more components when you get to the tier four that will need to be maintained uh, when you're doing a diesel tier four non-emergency uh, non product. All right, thanks, Steve, for that additional insight there. Bailey, we're going to kick it back to you, actually. Um, we've talked a lot about natural gas. question has come in about what about propane as a fuel source for standby generator sets? Uh, it's a good question, Jeff, because uh, propane or LP is a lot uh, easier and less expensive to store on site than natural gas. Uh, and at the lower end of the size range, as, as Steve mentioned during the uh, presentation, there's uh, the small end, it's, it's not that hard to, to offer um, an engine that can run on both propane and natural gas and, and maybe even automatically switch from one to the other. Uh, the challenge we have with larger systems, so say um, nominally 500 kilowatts and up, uh, is that propane has a very different combustion characteristic than natural gas. If you, if you think about the octane of gasoline for your car, uh, the, the natural gas or gas fuel equivalent is called methane number, and its uh, propane is very low, meaning that it's um, predisposed to uh, knock or predetonate, which causes problems in a larger gas engine that's operating with uh, relatively high boost pressures from the turbocharger. So on the, the larger engines, um, 
that are what we call lean burn to reduce uh, reduce emissions and have higher boost pressures. Uh, operating on propane is, is very difficult, if, if not impossible, and uh, in, in most cases impossible. So that's why we don't see uh, very much um, propane natural gas uh, dual fuel on the larger gas engine sizes. But but certainly with the, the smaller size range, you know the 100, 200 kilowatt range, it's it's more typical. All right, thanks, Bailey, for that clarity around propane and another part of the gas uh, spectrum of uh, different gases out there that you could use as, as, as a fuel source. So moving away from gases to more sustainable and hybrid applications, we had a question come in for a microgrid application and system resiliency. Is gas a preferred fuel to avoid fuel delivery problems? Steve, I'm going to start with you. And Bailey, if you have anything else to add, please, please do so. Great. I think this is a... Um certainly a place that we've got some experience in recently. And uh, when you speak microgrid, um, it's, it's certainly an application where you, your, your utility isn't uh, usually a common place. Uh, so we've typically seen it in island applications or remote applications. So obviously, um, usually in those locations, natural gas is not available from what we have seen. So diesel fuel has been mostly the, the application what's been used for for, de- for microgrid applications. But when you speak of running a generator set for a long period of time like you did in a, do in a microgrid application, certainly to reduce overall runtime and operating costs, natural gas would be preferred. And then also you can avoid some fuel delivery problems as well. It just usually isn't an option that we typically see in the microgrid remote applications um, is, is typically what we don't see. Steve, I might um, chip on chip in on that too. That um, we see some it, the, the question about fuel for system resiliency. I think depends on location. Kind of like you said, you addressed the availability of natural gas. I mean, we're seeing some uh, systems called microgrid systems uh, in areas that have utility power. Um, usually, it's it's a system that can, can connect or disconnect from the utility. And in and, and coastal areas, uh, we would encourage um, or or certainly suggest looking at natural gas since um, Superstorm Sandy and Hurricane Katrina and, and Harvey demonstrated that after a major weather event, uh, gas pipelines are usually unaffected, um, but diesel is, is the roads are blocked and closed, and it's not able uh, not able to get diesel to to refill tanks. So for those kind of applications, um, which might be a little bit more of an unconventional microgrid versus you know, something at a remote site, we, we might suggest looking at natural gas. All right, thanks for the details around a, a microgrid application. Obviously, you're incorporating a, a sustainable electricity supply, such as solar power or, or something to that effect. So, and, and CAT does have that, have that offering. So, beyond the natural gas and the diesel generator sets. So, Bailey, a, a point of clarity that one of our audience members asked was regarding gas generator sets. Is the 2000 KW the largest ga- uh, gas gen set that CAT makes? Uh, it's, it's a good question. It, it's actually not the largest. We, we also offer a, a, a 2.5 megawatt uh, gas generator set and a 3 megawatt and a 4 megawatt and actually also offer uh, a six and a half megawatt and a ten megawatt, uh, but for the for a standby application, uh, the two megawatt is the the largest that's uh, really suitable for a typical standby application. Uh, the other, the larger sizes are are optimized for high run hour, uh, continuous, um, <clears throat> or at least um, prime applications, and, and are not you know they're they're meant to run economically for large amounts of time. Uh, more than they're meant to start quickly for short periods of time. So we do make bigger ones, uh, up to 10 megawatts, um, but for standby applications, two or the two and a half are the the largest that are practical for standby. All right, thank you, Bailey, for that for that clarification there. So earlier, Bailey, you you had touched on dual fuel, so we're going to stick with that that, that uh, theme there. And this question that came in from the audience, I'm going to kick it over to Steve. Can you parallel a diesel with gas genset? Thanks, Jeff. It's, it's, um, it's something we've actually been addressing here a lot lately, specifically with some of the, the large hurricanes that came through. Um, the, the issue with getting fuel into sites uh, became an issue. So we do have some, some hospital applications 
that are specifically in Florida and other parts of the country that have the natural the, the diesel generator set there to pick up the 10 second load but they do have some natural gas generator sets there as well to keep in and extend the during a long outage so we are able to to parallel those gen sets together um, there's a, a few additional steps you need to make to, to parallel the natural gas with the G diesel generator sets but it's something we do fairly common and it's something in the application of a hospital or something where you do need to be prepared for an extended outage uh, is, is certainly something that we've, we've seen a lot of questions towards lately. Um, and it's something we, we can certainly help with if people do have questions related to that. All right, Steve, thanks for the, for the insight uh, regarding the, the question regarding paralleling with diesel and gas gen sets. Again, uh, we are getting a, a load of questions in today uh, uh, regarding this topic, so if we're not able to get to your question, obviously we'll have those available for you following today's webinar as soon as possible out on the landing page. But keep sending them in and uh, click on that Q&A function there at the bottom, uh, to the left of your screen and, uh, and keep submitting those questions. We want to make sure and try to get to as many as possible here before the top of the hour. Bailey, I want to go back to something you had covered early in the presentation. We had one of our audience members ask for a little bit of clarification around the uh, NFPA 110. And uh, you said 10 seconds to power available at the load terminals. Your illustration shows 10 seconds to the power available at the ATS load terminals. Can you, can you provide some further explanation regarding that? Yeah. Um. I think I was not as clear as I should have been. So when I said power at the load terminals, I mean the load terminals of the transfer switch. Um, so that's uh, at the, at within 10 seconds, right, the, the generator's got to start, and the transfer switch needs to switch to provide generator power to the load terminals of the transfer switch. So I hope that clarifies the question. All right, I think so. I appreciate the, the additional clarity, and hopefully our audience member who asked that question, uh, that, that answers your question. If not... Please submit it again, and, 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 and we'll get to, the, get to the right answer for you. So, Steve, question for you. Is there a KW point where the cost of gas starts to exceed diesel? I thought at one point it was uh, approximately 250 kilowatts. Sure. Another common question we got. Um, you know, certainly uh, when you get in the smaller KW size, there is a, there's a little bit of a breaking point from a dollar per KW standpoint where it makes sense to go from gas to diesel or diesel to gas and it's typically around the range of you know where the the, the industry uses more of the automotive uh, engines um, and it's typically around the the 150 kW 200 kW and below gen sets um, typically gas usually makes a little more sense uh, then when you start getting above that you know that's where some of the diesel makes more sense so um, it's, it's typically right around that automotive derivative, derivative engine. Um, it's, it's a low cost. The engines are, are built um, in, in mass quantities at that, those levels. So it's certainly uh, around that 150 to 200 kW and below um, where, where the cost, cost break point is. All right. Thanks for the, the clarity there. And as folks are weighing the cost along with footprint, along with the fuel source that they, that they have available to them, and making that selection, whether it's gas, diesel, or, or another option there. So, Bailey, I'm going to kick a question over to you now. Um, are all cat gas engines capable of full load impact? It's a great question, Jeff, um, and, and the answer is no. Uh, not all cat gas engines uh, are capable of accepting a 100% step load. So, like I mentioned uh, in response to the question about larger gas engines, we have a a large number of models that are optimized for uh, continuous running, whether it's continuous running, uh, burning alternative gases like landfill gas or biogas, uh, or, or continuous running on uh, natural gas for a combined heat and power application. And those generator sets generally uh, cannot accept a 100% block load because they're, they're optimized to be efficient and run a lot of hours with uh, minimal maintenance. Um, however, we have several uh, gas generator sets that are capable of accepting 100% block load. Uh, the largest uh, right now is one megawatt. So, so up to one megawatt gas, we can uh, accept 100% block load and um, also easily parallel those one megawatt units together if we need to uh, have a larger standby power plant. 
All right, thanks, Bailey, for that detail there. We're just going to keep rolling through the questions, guys, and just <laughs> we'll see how much we, how many more we can get in before the top of the hour here. So, Steve, we're going to kick it over to you. Can you can you use a standby diesel generator set for demand response? So this is something I, I started to get into a little bit earlier, uh, but didn't get into full details. But around two or three years ago, the EPA put out uh, an amendment. Um, small tweak, but it's something that could impact a lot of customers and clients out there is that demand response cannot be used on stationary emergency product any longer. So in the past we had sometime, I believe it, the, the previous uh, law let us use 15 hours of demand response on the standby generator. And the update has been that there, there's zero hours available on the stationary emergency product for demand response. So if you're working on a project or have, a, have an upcoming project where you're gonna be installing and have used demand response programs in the past, on the diesel side, this will, this will need to this will drive you to a tier four final product today. So, uh, could add additional costs if you're sticking with the diesel, or it might drive you to go to the natural gas generator set in the long run due to the additional costs on the tier four diesel side. So, something to keep in mind if you are using demand response or uh, have a client that's looking to do demand response in the future. All right, thanks, Steve, for, for that additional insight there regarding uh, demand response. So we do have just about four or five minutes left here before the top of the hour. And, Bailey, I'm going to kick a question over to you. And this is, again, regarding the gas generator sets. Are Caterpillar gas engine, engines just gasified diesel engines? That's a good question. Um, and, and the answer is that, you know, like we talked about in the uh, presentation, that the the engine block itself and some of the major iron components um, are very similar, if not the same. Um, but to call them a, a gasified diesel might be kind of a stretch because, you know, all of the uh, air fuel system and the control system is all completely different. So, so you could say that uh, while they share the same engine block and, and maybe the same crank, uh, from there out, the a cat gas engine is designed specifically for gas. Um, also probably worth mentioning that CAT has been building um, – gas engines since um since the 60s so we've been we've been at it a long time uh and, and developing engines specifically for gas uh you know for many decades so it's not like we just took a diesel engine uh, a couple years ago and, and gasified it we've uh, developed specifically for gas for for a long time all right thanks bailey for, for the additional insight there steve we one probably time for one more question here and we we heard from our audience that the impact uh regarding emissions can, can be large here. So do we know or do we have any thoughts here at Caterpillar about the EPA and any thoughts about them, uh, any new regulations coming out regarding emissions? Sure. It's, again, it's building on the, the last question, I guess, for demand response. But, you know, Tier 4 final on the non-emergency side is, is certainly a very, very strict requirement on, of emissions regulation. So we have not heard of anything or do not expect anything going to the anything beyond Tier 4 final at this time certainly could change at any time. And then also on the, the stationary side, at least on the diesel side, we, we, we don't see a lot of changes coming um, that are going to impact the, the regulations moving forward to develop new product or change the current regulations that are in place today. So we feel that as of right now, there's, there's going to be small tweaks, as, as we talk about with the demand response program. But in general, the, the EPA regulations for the, the stationary product uh, the emergency product and the non-emergency product are here probably for the foreseeable future or until um, some other changes come. But as of right now, we don't we don't expect any changes to be coming. All right. Thank you, Steve Turner. Thank you, Bailey Quintrell. And thanks to everyone who submitted questions. Unfortunately, we have got to that time where we've run out of time to answer all of your questions. But the good news is we do plan to respond to all those questions as soon as possible. The questions and answers, along with what we covered today, including a recording, will be posted on the landing page here in the near future, so please check back. Again, the CEUs will be issued by Bradley University to U.S.-based engineers that have requested them. We are already scoping out our next quarterly webinar, and we'll have further details to provide you in the very near future. Again, we appreciate the insight and expertise from Steve Turner and Bailey Quintrell from Caterpillar's Electric Power Group. We also appreciate your attendance and good questions as we explored gas versus diesel for standby. What's best for your customers? For Caterpillar Electric Power, I'm Jeff Muniz. Thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day.